Hello, and welcome to our program, Can't Stop, Won't Stop the Search for Relief, Scratching the Surface of Itch and Inflammation in Moderate to Severe Atopic Dermatitis. I'm Dr. Michael Blaze, Clinical Professor of Pediatrics at the Medical College of Georgia at Augusta University, and I'm joined today by my colleague, Dr. Jonathan Silverberg. Hello, I'm Dr. Jonathan Silverberg. I'm an Associate Professor of Dermatology uh, and the Director of Clinical Research at the George Washington University uh, School of Medicine and Health Sciences. And our faculty disclosures are displayed on the screen. So our discussion today will be the first of two Facebook Live sessions. Today we'll be covering the following learning objective. Apply knowledge gained about comorbidities and itch associated with moderate to severe atopic dermatitis to personalized treatment selection. So let's start off by providing our audience with a little bit of background information on atopic dermatitis. First slide. So as we see here, atopic dermatitis in the United States uh, affects almost 32 million Americans. It's one of the most common chronic conditions that we see in both the pediatric and adult population. The highest rate, as we know, is in children with up to 20% of children in the United States having atopic dermatitis. And again, a main problem in adults also with about 7% of adults suffering with the condition. Though many patients have mild disease, we have to realize that a lot of patients have moderate to severe disease. In fact, it's estimated that 29% of patients with atopic dermatitis have moderate disease, and 11%, in fact, have severe disease. It's important to know, just like we talk about pediatric asthma, that many of those children do not outgrow it and continue to have asthma problems in adulthood. We see the same type of thing in atopic dermatitis. In fact, it's estimated that 30% of childhood onset cases persist until adulthood. And very importantly, it doesn't have to just start in pediatrics. In fact, one out of four cases involves adult onset. If we look at the next slide, we are now looking at the burden of atopic dermatitis. And, and as we know, there's virtually no mortality associated with atopic dermatitis, but there's significant morbidity associated in our patient population. And first, as we see on the next slide, is related to reduced quality of life. And we know that patients with atopic dermatitis have a heavy psychosocial impact associated with their condition. We know that the patients, both children and adults, have a higher rate of anxiety and depression than what is seen in the general population, the ones that are suffering with atopic dermatitis. And we know that suicide ideation, in fact, is much higher in adolescents and adults with atopic dermatitis than the general population. And you may have seen an article within the last two years in JAMA, where in fact they showed that adults with atopic dermatitis had a higher rate of suicide than what's seen in the general adult population. And with all of this, they have a negative impact on both their academic, if we're talking about children, and job-related performance. And most of the reason for that comes to the next reason on the next slide, is we look at itch-related sleep disturbance. And we know a hallmark of atopic dermatitis is itch. In fact, it's the itch that rashes. And virtually all patients with atopic dermatitis have daily itching. And as you can see here, 42% have itching for greater than 18 hours a day. In fact, there's a diurnal of variation with uh, itch. And unfortunately, it's much worse at the night when patients are trying to sleep. And therefore, Patients with atopic dermatitis have trouble getting to sleep, they have trouble staying asleep, and they don't get the good deep REM and non-REM sleep needed. Uh, and therefore, the next morning, they have excessive daytime sleepiness, they have fatigue, they have decreased uh, quality of life, 
associated with these problems. As we see on the next slide, they also have increased infection risk. In fact, we know they have a higher rate of cutaneous infections. We know about the problems with Staph aureus. We can see eczema herpeticum related to herpes simplex, molluscum contagiosa. But there's also studies that show increased risk of systemic infections in both the adult and pediatric population. Things like strep throat, sinusitis, a recurrent otitis media. Now, unfortunately, we also see overuse of antibiotics in many of these patients related to use for skin when in fact there is not significant infection, they're needing antibiotics. And that the last burden, as we see on the next slide, relates to parent and caregiver burden. And this is not just a condition that affects the child. This is a condition that affects the whole family. And we know that parents, caregivers, have interrupted sleep about three times a week related to uh, their child's atopic dermatitis. It's been shown that parents of children with atopic dermatitis sleep about one hour less per night than parents of children with other types of chronic conditions. They also miss a lot of work, which causes a big burden on the family because these children are many times are having numerous flares during the year. It can last for over two weeks uh, and that burden associated to the family. And then like many conditions we deal with, especially chronic conditions, this is a high cost condition. And in fact, it's been shown that out of pocket costs for many patients with this condition can equal to about 10% of the annual family income. So while we're examining the substantial burden of atopic dermatitis imposes on patients, we should talk about the current state of patient satisfaction with treatment. So Dr. Silverberg, would you please elaborate on some of the work that's recently been done on this subject? Absolutely, and uh, thanks for the great introduction. Um, you know, I think the uh, that background really sets the stage to understanding that there's an enormous population burden, uh, but individual patient burden, family burden, et cetera. And uh, this gets reflected in terms of patient satisfaction. So uh, this slide depicts uh, some data from a, uh, a recent study uh, known as the Quest AD study. And this was a, uh, a, a study that looked at patients with moderate to severe atopic dermatitis who had had some uh, systemic, uh, you know, uh, therapy uh, in the recent past, and then examine prospectively uh, sort of the longitudinal course, but also assess treatment satisfaction uh, using the treatment satisfaction questionnaire for medications. And um, what they found was that there were substantial uh, unmet needs, uh, really across multiple domains. So the score ranges uh, for each of these domains from zero to 100 where a higher score represents better satisfaction. And what you can appreciate is that uh, really none of these scores uh, in the effectiveness domain, side effects, convenience, or global satisfaction are really at 100. Side effects uh, actually may have been the closest uh, to, to 100%, but in terms of effectiveness, it's really very low. Uh, and so too for convenience and global satisfaction as well. Um, and one of the interesting anecdotes with this is that the uh, satisfaction actually drops amongst those who are actively experiencing a flare. Uh, and so you can appreciate for, uh, you know, the, those in uh, red uh, indicates those with currently experiencing a flare for effectiveness, lower scores compared to the ones in blue that are not currently experiencing a flare. So we understand that even at baseline outside of a flare, there can be poor treatment satisfaction, challenges managing the disease long-term, but within that acute flare, uh, even greater unmet needs. Uh, now that we've had a chance to describe the prevalence and the impact of atopic dermatitis, let's talk a little bit more about what we know about its underlying causes. Now, you know, these kinds of figures can sometimes be uh, a little intimidating, uh, and there's many of these types out there in the literature. And really what, you know, the first take home message when you look at something like this is recognize this is a very complex heterogeneous disease that has many different pathways in terms of barrier disruption and immune dysregulation that are all, you know, interacting with each other. 
So on the leftmost uh, side of the uh, screen, you can appreciate what is uninvolved skin, uh, relatively flat looking epidermis, uh, no real evidence of epidermal hyperplasia. And what you see are essentially, you know, those T helper two cells, right? Those are the effector cells that appear to play the most important role uh, in all stages of the disease, but particularly early on. And as you move across from left to right, what you're seeing is a change happening not only in the barrier, where as you get to that far end of the right, you have this thickened skin barrier, epidermal hyperplasia, which is now going to lead to that dry skin, flaky skin, open or, uh, you know, sores in the skin, uh, oozing, weeping, etc. But you also have that inflammation progressing where you have this activation, recruitment, and expansion of T helper 2 cells. You have production of interleukins 4 and 13, interleukin 5 as well. You get eosinophils, mast cells. And then in chronic stages of the disease, you start to see all kinds of other cell types, but mainly the T helper 1 cell types. This really illustrates the complexity uh, in terms of the immune pathways. And we see the complexity manifest itself in the clinical picture as well. I would argue that atopic dermatitis shouldn't even be considered uh, just one disease, maybe a spectrum or a phenotype with multiple subtypes, because clinically it can manifest in so many different ways. Uh, this slide depicts uh, some recent data that we published examining uh, the most common triggers of itch in adults with atopic dermatitis. And this is a little bit of a complex uh, methodology here uh, called latent class analysis that tries to pull out the different patterns of itch uh, or, or you know, patterns in general of, of categorical variables. In this case, it's the different itch triggers. And first, one of the things to note is that the most common trigger uh, to actually cause problems in atopic dermatitis for itch uh, is actually sweat. And so it's sweat, stress are the big two. And I think it's a little counterintuitive. We often might think about the dryness of the winter. That is a big one too, but most commonly it's actually heat and sweat and, and stress that, that do it. But there are different patterns that come up. There are some patients that have, in, you know, in light blue, you can appreciate these light blue bars. These are the patients that have pretty much every single trigger. Everything sets their skin off. They're so exquisitely sensitive. These tend to be the more severe ones. Then you have patients who, you know, as you see the orange bars, yeah, not, not so many triggers. It seems to, you know, be a little bit milder, a little bit more of a stable course. And then there are different sort of constellations of symptoms that can come up and can cause issues. And I think, you know, we're still in our infancy of marrying the clinical data to the basic science data, but you can bet that that heterogeneity of the mechanism uh, of, of disease is contributing to this heterogeneity in terms of uh, the various triggers. Now, uh, a, a term that uh, we often use uh, and reference when talking about atopic dermatitis is this concept of the atopic march. Uh, Dr. Blaze, would you be please elaborate on exactly what this is? Sure, sure. and as you can see on the slide, here we're seeing the atopic march. Sometimes you may hear this uh, described as the allergic march. What this really refers to is the natural history or typical progression of allergic diseases that usually start very early in life. And as we know, atopic dermatitis, uh, almost a majority of the children are going to develop it will within the, the first uh, year uh, of life. And then a substantial number of those particular children will go on to develop food allergy, usually the most common we see in children with atopic dermatitis being egg allergy, but they can develop others. And then as they get older, we see a high percentage of these patients going on to develop allergic rhinitis and asthma. So, so what we know is that uh, uh, when we look at proportions that are developing um, 
atopic dermatitis that go on to develop food allergy, it seems to be about 30% of those children. And then when we look at a, things like allergic rhinitis and asthma, it's up to 60% of those children that had atopic dermatitis will go on to develop those conditions. Um, we know that children with atopic dermatitis, the more severe their atopic dermatitis is, the more likely, in fact, that they'll go on to develop asthma associated with their condition. Yeah. You know, there's a very interesting uh, manuscript. You know, the, the atopic march is this concept's obviously been around for, for quite some time. And uh, almost immediately when it came out, you know, there were a lot of folks who questioned it, you know, and said, uh, should we call it a march? Should we call it a gallop? Right? Because some people don't seem to follow that exact sort of time course, maybe a little faster. And there's a fascinating meta-analysis that was published a few years back, I believe in current dermatology reports, that found that if you look across all the different literature, there's actually a lot of different trajectories. And atopic march in its classic sense is one of those important ones. It's not the only one. And I think that's in of itself quite fascinating when you think about mechanistically. Uh, but I think that's such an important subset because, you know, there's this idea. And the question is, how early? Would you have to intervene? But perhaps if you could intervene early enough, maybe you could mitigate, you know, some of that atopic march. Do we have any data really to uh, to illustrate this point, or is that really more of just uh, uh, hope at this stage? Uh, unfortunately, I think it's hope at this stage. There's been publication recently of several interesting studies that I think a lot of us were really hoping, in fact, would have an effect as far as turning off the or stopping the march uh, of these children. So there have been recent studies, uh, one recently published it in, in Lancet related to emollients. You talked about the, the epidermal barrier uh, dysfunction. And so the thought was it was in early infancy starting these children at risk with emollients. Uh, unfortunately, uh, that study, in fact, failed. It did not have an effect as far as uh, stopping the atopic march. The other that I was also hoping that may show some benefit here uh, is another uh, study uh, out, of, uh, out of Europe where they looked at oral bacterial lysate. So they used uh, uh, heat uh, inactivated bacteria like uh, gram-negative E. coli and others and they started infants on this very early in life. With the thought being is that by exposing the body early to bacteria, you would switch from a Th2 tendency, which we see with atopic dermatitis and the other diseases of the atopic march, to more of a T1 type of, of uh, immunity. Unfortunately, those studies were just recently published and they did not predict. Uh, the continuation of the atopic march. And then there's been some off and on data with probiotics, which has not been that strong. So unfortunately, really at this time, we don't have any therapeutic intervention uh, that we can lead to a halt of the atopic march. Yeah, I, I'm hopeful uh, that, that I, think, I think there's something there with all of those, particularly with the emollients early on. There was some pilot data initially that generated a lot of positive buzz. Uh, but I think it gets back to the points we've been discussing, just how complex the disease is. And maybe it works for a specific subset. Maybe you have to get there even earlier. You know, so I think we're, we're going to see a lot more data about these interventions. Um, you know, even with the probiotics, there's some data to suggest maybe if you go to mixed strains, you might see better results than if you go to lactobacillus alone. So I, I while I agree, I think it's still too early for us to, to feel like we have something that's truly remittive or curative or even make an evidence-based recommendation per se. I think we're close, and I'm optimistic that in the next few years, we will get some home runs and figure out the right subsets of patients where these, these types of interventions would work. Yeah. So yeah, thank you. Be great for our patients. Absolutely. Yes. So, you know, in addition to these atopic uh, comorbidities, we should also discuss uh, some of the uh, non-atopic comorbidities that come up. And these are uh, important ones and ones that are often not so commonly recognized. Um, and so this 
schematic, really it just provides a high level summary of a lot of research that has been done examining these various non-atopic comorbidities. So I'll start, you know, simply skin pain. Skin pain is one that, you know, you could call it a comorbidity. You could call it a symptom of atopic dermatitis. Um, it may be semantics. The reality is it's there and it's common. And it's even more common in moderate to severe disease. And this is starting to become increasingly recognized as an important symptom that we need to intervene with and that may get better with some of the, you know, the current and emerging therapies. Uh, sleep disturbance. Again, I, I would argue these are symptoms of atopic dermatitis because we know that, you know, from the sleep, uh, you know, from the chronic itch, the scratching, and of course the pain, um, all of that is going to make it difficult for patients to fall asleep and stay asleep. Uh, but we're seeing other signals as well for even things like restless, restless leg syndrome. Some studies with mixed results, but possibly obstructive sleep apnea, uh, insomnia, parasomnias. So a variety of different sleep pathologies, uh, which are really quite fascinating in of themselves. Um, Dr. Blaze already mentioned the, the mental health issues, depression, suicidality, anxiety. There are now multiple uh, systematic reviews and meta-analyses that have shown really quite strong signals. Interesting, for atopic dermatitis, the strongest signal is actually for anxiety, even more so than depression, which is a little bit different than some of the other inflammatory skin diseases out there where it might be the flip-flop. Uh, and then suicidality as well. Now, you know, we often think of suicidality as a of course, a symptom of depression, and of course it can be, but it turns out that some studies have even shown higher rates of suicidality even in the absence of depression. And in the world of mental health, that's a very unique subset of patients that is still trying to, you know, there, there's, there are many attempts to understand why there, there might be suicidal tendencies without frank depression, but this is something that can even happen in atopic dermatitis. We've already discussed the, the myriad atopic comorbidities. I think one thing we can add to that would also be eosinophilic esophagitis. In the old literature about the atopic march, we didn't really even know about eosinophilic esophagitis, but now that we do, we tend to think of it as an even a later stage of evolution of the atopic march that comes down further in time. Allergic contact dermatitis. So this is one that's been very controversial because Overall, it might be that atopic dermatitis patients don't have higher risk of allergic contact dermatitis than the rest of the population. But when they do get it, they almost always will get it to their own personal care products, to their emollients, to their topical medications. So it becomes very clinically relevant because it's often the stuff that they've been using for extended periods that gives them trouble down the road. We already heard about the uh, cutaneous and extracutaneous infections. There are many. Uh, we've published several studies showing higher rates of sepsis, endocarditis, you name it. Uh, not The absolute effect sizes on these are not enormous, but it's a fascinating signal that is showing up for myriad different cutaneous, extracutaneous infections. And then most recently, and perhaps most controversial, are some of the cardiometabolic comorbidities, something that we're quite familiar with another uh, inflammatory skin disease, psoriasis. And more recently, we've discovered is there in atopic dermatitis, they have higher rates of smoking, earlier age of onset of smoking, higher rates of obesity, particularly central obesity. Uh, and we're seeing mixed results across different studies, but multiple studies showing higher rates of cardiovascular disease risk factors, hypertension, uh, you know, hyperlipidemia, as well as actual cardiovascular disease and, and heart failure. So really uh, suggesting that atopic dermatitis really affects the whole patient and goes well beyond uh, the skin. So let's shift gears now and let's turn our attention to the diagnosis of atopic dermatitis. And as you see here, this is the 2018 Diagnostic Criteria for Atopic Dermatitis from the American Academy of Dermatology. And as you're probably aware, there is no blood test, there is no biomarker uh, to diagnose atopic dermatitis. In fact, we diagnose it by history and physical exam. So you can see here some of the essential components that we should see in all our patients. Obviously, we itch or pruritus. We mentioned it's the itch that rashes. Obviously, they have eczema. Now, we tend to use the term eczema and atopic dermatitis mean the same thing, but 
there are many different types of eczema. In fact, eczema comes from the Greek word meaning boiling out. So we see the typical eczema lesions, the oozing type of lesions going all the way to chronic thickening or lichenification of the skin. We have the typical morphology, and the history of our patients can be chronic, though we mentioned about flares as they can be relapsing. One of the key things in atopic dermatitis is the age-specific patterns. And in those infants and children, we tend to see primarily involvement in the face and the neck and the extensor surfaces. And then as they get older, we see a high rate of lesions in the flexural areas. So the antecubital, popliteal fossa, and classically, they're sparing of the groin in the axillary regions. Now, what are some of the important criteria? Well, as we mentioned, there's usually a very early onset of age associated uh, with, this, with this condition, and obviously a high rate of atopy seen in these particular patients. Many times we get a personal or, fa or we get a personal or family history of atopic dermatitis or, or allergies. Ig reactivity again to inhalants or or foods, and then the xerosis. Now there are several things here as far as in the differential that are important. Obviously, in the young child, a seborrheic dermatitis. Again, this usually is not pruritic. Uh, it doesn't have the same distribution as atopic dermatitis. These are usually yellow, scaly type of lesions, and very commonly in the groin and axillary region that we do not see atopic dermatitis. Uh, as Jonathan, Dr. Silverberg mentioned about contact dermatitis, it can be of itself, but also can be related to many of the treatments, many of the ointments and creams that we use on the patient with atopic dermatitis. Another condition that, that's been referred to many, many times for atopic dermatitis, and in fact, the child had scapes. Again, scapes, there may be a, good, a history of other people in the family uh, having, having itching, you usually see the transverse lines, and typically scapes may involve the palms and the soles, where we don't usually see that with atopic dermatitis. And immunodeficiencies. And if you see a child with eczema in the first month of life, second month of life, one needs to think about the possibility of an immunodeficiency, because typical atopic dermatitis usually starts after three months of age. So things like westcott aldrich syndrome or histiocytosis X, you should be thinking about. And then you can see some of the other ones here like ichthyosis and psoriasis. So once we established, you know, that diagnosis of atopic dermatitis, I think it's very important that in fact we evaluate the patient's disease severity. So typically, we're going to look at the number of lesions that the patient's having, the types of lesions, uh, the oozing, lichenification. We're going to look at the degree of distribution, how what percent of the body, in fact, uh, is covered with atopic dermatitis. But that's just part of it, because when we're looking at severity of patients with atopic dermatitis, we also need to look at their quality of life. We need to look at how their sleep is impacted. And very importantly, as we see in this next slide, of the impact of itch associated in our patients with atopic dermatitis. So this particular study by Simpson uh, used the um, 5D pariah scale, uh, item four, if you look over to, the, uh, uh, over to the left. Now this 5D pariah scale is a multi-dimensional survey and it measures one degree, two duration, three direction, four disability, and five distribution. So those are the five Ds. And here, item four is looking at disability. So we're looking at the impact on sleep related to atopic dermatitis. And as you can see here, uh, if you look at uh, about six, a little over 68% of the patients had delay falling asleep or occasionally or frequently resulting in awakening at night. So again, the major impact of itch on sleep. And then if we look over to the right, at the impact on different activities related to itch. We already mentioned sleep, but you see the high rate associated uh, with, with leisure and social, uh, housework and errands, work and study. So itch is a major factor as far as when we're looking at the severity of our patient with, with atopic dermatitis. Now, clearly, uh, the evaluation of itch 
uh, is important for helping to guide uh, disease management. And yet, you know, there's really no standard tool that we use as far as uh, monitoring itch in our patient population. I mean, typically, I'm just going to ask the patient, you know, how much itching are they having? Sometimes I'll use a visual analog scale. Uh, I want to find out if it's affecting their sleep or their other activities like we saw in the last slide. Um, so, so, Dr. Silverberg, uh, how do you assess itch in your particular patient population with atopic dermatitis? Yeah, I'm, I'm a, perhaps a little bit of an anomaly because we do some more extensive patient reported outcomes. Uh, I find them to be incredibly valuable. I don't know if it's meant for every practice, but I think there's a lot of important lessons to be learned. Uh, I think the first thing to recognize, and, and you know, I think we've talked a, a lot about this um, indirectly, but uh, it's important to state that with all of the objective assessments that we could use, an easy score, an IGA score, a body surface area, they tell us important information, but they don't always tell us what's going on with the symptoms. You know, if you look at studies, they have good enough concordance or correlation, but not perfect, not even close. So I think the first thing to recognize is you have to ask about the itch because if you don't, just looking at the skin, you're going to miss it. Um, now, then the question is, what's the best tool? Well, I think the simplest and, and perhaps one of the most easily interpretable ones would be to use something like a single item numeric rating scale of itch, you know, scale of zero to 10, 10 being the worst itch possible, zero being not at all, you know, asking the patient to rate their, their worst itch or their average itch in the past week or so. Um, and that's been validated and shown to be quite meaningful. It takes a whole of five seconds to do. Your MAs can do it when they're intaking patients, you know, uh, through the EHR or in the waiting area. It takes no time at all, and it provides really rich information. But I wouldn't stop just there. I would assess even an NRS of skin pain, and we'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slides. And I would also assess an NRS for sleep disturbance. Because what we have seen from a number of studies is that while sleep disturbance correlates overall with itch, it's not only because of itch. And the, you know, there, are other, there may be effects of systemic inflammation or mood issues in terms of the mental health and other things. So it's an important domain to ask. But if you were to ask an NRS itch, an NRS pain, an NRS sleep, it would take less than 30 seconds, and you would have very, very rich information about the symptoms and of themselves. There's also opportunities to even use things like the POEM, the patient-oriented eczema measure, which has an itch item in there, but also has an item about sleep, also asks uh, four other or five other symptoms. Very easy to use, very easy to code, and very much valid for, for clinical practice. So I think those are the ones that I would sort of start with as you start to think about ways in which you can systematically assess patients. And I would be remiss not to mention one other one, which as simple as it sounds, maybe works better than all of them. And that is a patient reported global assessment of severity uh, or shortened by many as the patient global assessment. And that is ask them, how is your disease? Mild, moderate, severe, uh, clear, almost clear, right? And as simple as that is, you'd be amazed how the patient knows exactly how bothered they are by their disease. And it doesn't, you know, it's not perfectly related to itch. It's not perfectly related to the lesions, but it's a holistic assessment that takes all of those into account. And is one that I, again, I would highly encourage because you might look at the skin and say, ah, you know, you don't look so bad. And the patient says, listen, I'm going crazy with itch. You need to treat me better. And if you don't ask those questions, you're going to definitely miss that. So I think there's a lot of things that we definitely could uh, assess there. So um, I, I mentioned a little bit already about the uh, skin pain issue, and I want to show a little bit more uh, data related to that because we've learned of recent that, um, you know, the, the uh, skin pain is something that comes up quite commonly in the uh, practice setting. Uh, and so uh, this is, you know, I actually, our group has published several studies on this. This is something that was shown actually in this uh, Simpson et al. paper that Dr. Blaze mentioned as well in moderate to severe disease. But I, I want to take you through a few key points. Uh, so one, so this study was done on a clinical cohort of patients with mild, moderate, and severe disease. This is a real world clinical registry study uh, that assessed an NRS skin pain. Uh, and uh, over the past week, 
and uh, so broke down pain into uh, you know groupings of mild, moderate, and severe. Mild would be zero to an NRS score of zero to three. Moderate would be four to six. Severe, very severe, would be seven through ten, and and then broke it up based on you know the overall severity of atopic dermatitis based on their patient global assessment. And what you can appreciate is that really in mild disease, um, which is that lightest blue color, yeah, most of the patients are going to be in that mild to moderate skin pain, but 39% with moderate skin pain, 10% with severe skin pain. When you get into that moderate patient group, the numbers go up a little bit more. And when you get into the severe group, that's really where you see this uh, you know, more severe component of skin pain, where amongst those with severe atopic dermatitis, 71% reported severe skin pain. So I think that's an important one. This is a symptom that for whatever reason over the past decades has not been given the proper respect or attention and now is starting to be recognized as being an important player. Why should we care though? Well, we know of course pain is an important issue for, for so many patients across so many diseases, but we can actually show this where on the right panel in orange, you can appreciate that there's this stepwise increase of, of DLQI scores, the Dermatology Life Quality Index. The higher the number, the worse the quality of life. And you can appreciate that the more severe the skin pain, the worse their quality of life gets. So we see directly uh, to uh, you know, the, uh, you know, poor quality of life uh, for patients. So this brings us to a close uh, for our discussion tonight. Uh, so to recap, atopic dermatitis is a chronic inflammatory skin disorder characterized by itch, often very intense, and rash. Sleep loss due to itching impairs social and work-related activity, emotional well-being, and overall health-related quality of life. Atopic dermatitis increases the risk for a range of atopic and non-atopic comorbidities that must be considered to provide optimal care. An accurate assessment of itch and skin pain at diagnosis and throughout the course of care are crucial to effective treatment. So Dr. Silverberg, uh, before we end this evening, do you have any final thoughts that you'd like to share with our audience? Yeah, so, I mean, first, uh, thank you for just a, uh, an outstanding discussion. I think it's really a great conversation. Um, I, I think there are a couple of really key points that we've touched upon that I really hope uh, any clinician walks away from and really takes to heart when they're seeing patients. One is recognizing that atopic dermatitis is not just skin deep, that there is an impact that is clearly going well beyond just that you know, that superficial impact uh, that we might visually appreciate on the skin, impacting all aspects of quality of life and really all aspects of health, from mental health, physical health, et cetera. And then the second is recognizing in particular that, you know, while we may be tempted to focus in on the visual aspects of atopic dermatitis when we're assessing these patients, please don't neglect the symptoms. The symptoms are what are gonna bring the patients in the most the symptoms are what patients are going to be using to judge their response to therapy the most, and it's ultimately going to be what, how they judge their satisfaction with their care the most. So pay attention, assess it early and often, and make sure to monitor that and set good treatment goals to improve those symptoms over time. Those are great words. I think that all of us that manage these patients, we really have to be empathetic with these patients. They really are suffering, and we really have to do our best to get their condition under control. And again, not just the skin, but all the comorbidities and quality of life uh, that you mentioned this evening. So, so thank you, Dr. Silverberg. And again, thank to you. our audience, thank you for joining us tonight. So please be sure to join us for our next Facebook Live session on Tuesday, October 13th at 8 p.m., where I'll be joined by, by Dr. Jim Sublett and which will delve into other issues related to the care of patients with atopic dermatitis, including treatment and long-term considerations for management. Thank you.